Good morning, everybody. Hope you all are doing well today. Uh, just want to mention a quick few things before we get started. Uh, first and foremost, do remember that your reflection paper is due tomorrow. That's Friday uh, by 11.59 p.m. March 2nd. So please make sure that you are completing that at your earliest convenience. Um, with that, um, remember that it's the uh, Dropbox on as you learn for that. And if you have any questions in the meantime, please feel free to email me and I will get to you as soon as possible. Um, so that's the main thing I wanted to mention as far as assignments today. Um, however, today is a uh, is one of our Theory Thursdays that I wanted to talk about uh, what you see out of here. Now, granted, this is a little bit out of, uh, or this is uh, through a specific context, as you see here, um, a doctrinal context here. And, um, but this is through cognitive dissonance theory. So this is a very important theory within the realm of persuasion. It's probably one of my personal favorites uh, in terms of our cognition and how we uh, perceive things, especially when things don't usually go our way in some s sense of fashion. So the way that this starts is this is actually kind of a parable um, for how this theory kind of start, got started, uh, which I may have told you I'm gonna, about it. Uh, I'm going to expand on it a little bit. But suffice to say, it's uh, about a fox, actually. So the animal fox um, sees a tree that has grapes on it. And the fox comes up to the tree and notices that it cannot reach the grapes. So they are too high. They can't be obtained. And so the fox sits there and says, how am I supposed to cope with the fact that I physically cannot get to these grapes? So the notion of it is he had to convince himself that he doesn't need the grapes. He doesn't need this particular food. Um, and that's how he comes to a little bit of what's called consonance into his brain. Um, so this is this removal of the inconsistency of terms of things that the fox in this case can control versus things he can't control and how does he rectify that within his brain now granted we're talking about an animal here um, but at the same time we run into this pr uh, problem quite a bit actually um, when we're again faced with something that is mentally unstable um, in terms of an unpleasant arousal in this case. So when we feel this way of uh, having a, two different thoughts going on in our brain here, we, we have this feeling of uh, ner nervousness. We have this feeling of um, being unnerved in this case that we need to resolve something. So this is very important to consider when we're thinking about this particular area within communication is that when we have two competing thoughts, it's always that area of uh, uncertainty. So we try to relieve said uncertainty by trying to create a balance with our own mind. And so this happens um, in a book called When Prophecy Fails. And it's a really interesting book. I, I really encourage you to pick it up um, if you are re really interested in this particular theory because it's by a gentleman named Leon Fessinger. And Leon Fessinger, this, okay, I'm going to give you a small disclaimer. Leon Fessinger does a little bit in terms of talking about organized religion and uh, some of the claims within organized re religion. I don't, I don't really think he meant to like um, poke at a certain organized religion or religions in this case. He's merely saying that there are some instances where um, a claim is made within religion. People really take to it, believe it, and it turns up not being true. So the example he uses is when people claim that the rapture, um, so we, which is real popular within the Christian faith, um, through you know books of Re Revelation in this case, that um, there will be a return. And within the rapture, now I'm not trying to step on people's beliefs myself, but the, the area that he talks about is that there are uh, people that state that the rapture is going to occur on this particular day. So it's not that, again, that we're 
looking at Christianity in a negative light in this case. All we're saying is that there are people that kind of take advantage of a little bit of the system and say, this is when the rapture is going to happen. And so there's, there are people that believe that and they sit there and say, okay, this prominent figure said the rapture is going to happen. And what ends up happening is it doesn't occur on this particular day. Um, and so what happens? So then people kind of have to justify why didn't this happen? Why are we in a position where this was a supposed to occur? Whereas what actually happened was quite the opposite. So um, Leon Fessinger was really interested in this. And so this was just one area within this um, belief that people had. Um, so he mentions this a couple times, but the thing that he was really interested in, so uh, within his own experiment, was he had uh, some of the people that he worked with uh, join a cult. Um, now, granted, this wasn't a cult where, uh, and unfortunately, uh, you know, people would pass away because of it. This was a situation where um, this particular lady believed that a group of aliens were going to uh, take her off the planet and then the planet would be destroyed. Um, so this was a very strong belief that this particular woman had and she ended up becoming a leader of an, uh, a select group of people that also uh, really felt this particular way that again a group of aliens would come by, pick them up, and leave the earth. So they, so Leon had this idea of what happens when it doesn't happen. So when the aliens do not come, uh, they are not rescued from uh, the destruction of the earth and obviously the earth is not destroyed. So how do we justify that within our brain here um, when it doesn't occur? So this is where you see the model here in this case where there's a doctrine and a belief structure. Now again, I mentioned before that beliefs are very tricky. Um, and, and this doesn't inherently have to be beliefs. This can be attitudes, thoughts, uh, opinions, that kind of thing, um, values. All those can be considered within your own cognition and there's an inconsistency between what's being presented and what you believe. So again, think of things that you see something that goes directly against what you think about, what you believe, what you uh, are strongly uh, held in your values or, you know, just has an attitude about. And how do you face that? Um, and for a lot of us, we go through this process of dissonance of what we have here. And so uh, what you'll see here is uh, changing belief, changing your doctrine, or changing the doctrine that's being presented to you, or change perception of the doctrine. And any of these things can re result in what's called um, cognitive consonance, um, which basically states, you know, this is where I make sense of everything. This is a, this is a rationale that we're trying to achieve here uh, in terms of what's going on. So if the doctrine in this case, so if there's information that is presented in front of me that disagrees with what I see, then what occurs is I need to either need to change the belief I had because of the doctrine that's been presented to me. Um, I can also change the doctrine itself, which, you know, obviously if it's being presented to you, it can be kind of hard. Or I can change perception of the doctrine itself. So um, this is something that I will actually, um, I may not actually change the doctrine, but I'll change how I think about it. Um, to really build this. So let me give you an example. Um, so my my parents are big Alabama Crimson Tide fans. So they're, they're very adamant about um, this particular, especially college football. They love Alabama and college football, and naturally so. They're really good. Um, but what occurred one time was there was a coach that came to Alabama. His name was Lane Kiffin. And um, what occurred here was that up to the higher, um, my parents really did not like this person. It was not a big fan of Lane Kiffin um, as a coach for different teams. Just, just wasn't a big fan. So they find out that this particular coach is going to be hired. So this is their belief about the coach. 
the doctrine comes in that the coach is going to be hired into something that they really like. So these are what are called um, unit relationships um, to where they can exist within the topic itself. So again, um, this is about Alabama, but at the same time, now we're dealing, we're adding a different layer within uh, what we know about Alabama in this case. So, um, so this is where it comes in. So the doctrine comes in that Lane Kevin's going to be the coach. And their belief is that they don't like Lane Kiffin. However, they love Alabama. So this is where this dissonance comes in. And this is where unpleasant arousal comes in. Because, again, having these disagreements in your head is actually very unpleasant. And it's, again, something that we don't like because of, uh, you know, this uncertainty. Because, again, we feel like my belief has to change or something has to change. So what happens? So within this example, I can change the belief of how I feel about uh, Lane Kiffin, which is what happened. Um, for, for the spoiler alert here, uh, my parents said, you know what, maybe he's not such a bad person. And that's an interesting concept because you could say, um, no, I'm going to change the doctrine in this case um, where, you know, if, if they didn't like them so much, so this is where the unit relationship really specific is if they were to say I really don't like this person at all um, I'm ashamed that Alabama hired said person um, so I'm gonna just change the doctrine of itself and in this case I just won't like Alabama anymore so that would be the decision there um, or again you can separate it into unit relationships of saying I'm gonna still like Alabama but I'm not gonna like Lane Kiffin so this one's a little bit more difficult um, in terms of the change that removes the inconsistency uh, because you'll still have that um, if, if that occurs in this case. So, um, you know, this, this is a very difficult thing here uh, in order to uh, find your way in here um, when it comes to becoming consonant in your uh, cognition. The same thing could be said with, I mean, there's, there's tons of examples in terms of changing a belief. Uh, one of the ones I always came up with is, you know, if you ever had the belief in Santa Claus at one point, which, you know, spoiler alert, unfortunately. Um, but again, seeing the doctrine of the fact that Santa's not real uh, versus your belief, again, do you change the belief and says Santa isn't real? Do I go in full on denial? Or, you know, what is it that I do in this case to remove that inconsistency? So, um, and we desire that consistency um, because, you know, these are areas that we want to feel comfortable within our own mind. Um, and we try to uh, look at it in terms of dissonance are created by psychological inconsistencies. Um, we don't enjoy this state, and so it motivates us to find consonants in an effort to have uh, dissonance re re for re excuse me have dissonance reduction. Some other uh, assumptions can be the magnitude of dissonance. So the degree of importance is really important here. So I want to value this relationship of harmony and balance, but you know I might argue with a significant other or a friend all the time. Um, you know, other things could be, for example, in terms of the magnitude, uh, they can see it as it's not that bad. So um, you could have, for instance, a doctor or a nurse uh, that works in intensive care and he or she smokes. Uh, they know it's unhealthy, but the perception is it keeps that person's weight down. So instead of dealing with uh, cholesterol or, um, you know, uh, problems with diabetes, that kind of thing. You know, this is one of the reasons I smoke to kind of curb my hunger in this case. So they find the reasons to say, look, I understand that smoking is bad for me. However, um, I'm going to justify it by this particular reason. And again, that could be, you know, dangerous in this case of uh, how you really look at it. Uh, in this case, think of yourself as communication majors. I mean, this, we talk a lot about mass comm in this place and uh, within uh, this particular class, and you probably have it in different classes, um, in terms of you see magazines and covers of ads that you know don't reflect reality. So why do we feel so bad? Um, 
So that's important. You might also want to consider, again, how significant is the issue. So with my Lane Kiffin example, it's not that crucial. But if you're dealing with your health, okay, this is a major component of um, how much you might suffer in this case. So we have to think about it in terms of um, identity. We might want to think of it as a area of relationships. Um, Last, we might want to look at in terms of uh, our dissonance ratio. So the aspects of dissonance to consonants. Um, and you might say, what are, would be some examples in your relationships in terms of your consonants uh, versus your dissonance? And consonance is that feeling the need to be out in the open, to be yourself. You could probably look at this as uh, I mentioned in another class about coming out in this particular case where that consonance is really difficult or excuse me the dissonance is really difficult um where we're um feeling that the dissonance of basically lying about who you are um can be very difficult and it's not until you go into this consonance of actually explaining what's going on um so that's really important to consider uh, when you're looking at this particular theory. So I hope this makes sense. Um, like I said, I think it's a really cool theory. Um, and you're going to hear it a lot as I go through. I mean, you've already heard it a lot uh, as I've talked through some of our, our not only our theories, but um, some of our context in general. So um, like I said, take a look at that. Think about it. If there's anything that confuses you, please take the time to let me know. And uh, yeah. But I think this would be. A, I think this is a really cool one to uh, potentially analyze um, if this is something you're interested in with your reflex, your third reflection paper or uh, your final paper. So, anyway, thank you for your time. Um, I am obviously not going to be giving a recording on Friday, nor uh, will I give one next week uh, because it's spring break. We will talk a little bit about our midterm, which will be after spring break. It's not on your syllabus. I forgot to put it on there, but um, I'll talk more about that as that comes along. So just be on the lookout next uh, the following week. So after spring break, um, I will give out a study guide as well as present what's on that study guide um, with regards to the test. And we'll go from there. So um, you all have a great week, um, great rest of your week. Have a great spring break. Have fun. Be safe. Um, and like I said, if there's any questions, please let me know. Don't forget your reflection paper on Friday. Um, that's going to be really important. And again, if you have questions about that, please let me know. So again, have a wonderful spring break, and I will talk to you in a couple weeks. All right. Bye.